Hi everyone, my name is Ari Rudolph. I'm the Vice President of Philanthropic Engagement at JFN. Uh, I am so happy to have you join us today for the workshop, Post-Corona Jewish Life After the Pandemic. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dan Sina, the co-author of the best-selling uh, book, Startup Nation. We'll get us started and introduce us to the other speakers. Dan, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Ari. Uh, hi everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, discussion. I am uh, going to bring David Ingber in to start. Now, is David on here? Uh, don't see him. He's there. He is? Okay. All right. David. Yeah, but maybe we'll pin, pin each other. There yeah. we go. There we go. Pin him. All right. I got, I got him. Okay, great. So um, what we're going to do in this discussion, so I, I, as, as was mentioned, I have this podcast called Post Corona in which we try to have a discussion each week about a different sector of the economy, a different set, mostly focused on the economy and geopolitics and trends related to either globally and try to understand how these, these sectors have been transformed in some cases for the better, in some cases much worse. But one thing we're clear on is that we're experiencing some changes that will likely outlive uh, the pandemic, changes that have been catalyzed by the pandemic. And, um, and so we're trying to have a post-corona-like conversation with two leaders who are operationally on the front lines of the Jewish world and the future of the Jewish world, both <laughs> the pre-pandemic Jewish world, the trans-corona uh, Jewish world, meaning as we get through this uh, mess, and then the post-corona Jewish world. And they two people have been thinking a lot about that, one in Jewish congregational life and the other in the Jewish educational world and the day, the day school world. We're going to start with David Ingber for about a 25 minutes. Then we're going to have a conversation with uh, Ariella Dubla Furman, and then we're going to uh, merge the two and we're going to take Q and a, um, I'm going to start with uh, David, who many of you know is the founder and leader and chief rabbi of Ramamu, which is uh Full disclosure, our congregation, mine and Campbell's and our family's uh, synagogue. And uh, it's one of the most innovative. It already was one of the most innovative congregations that we had uh, worked with and been a part of uh, anywhere in, in the diaspora. And I think they've kind of taken that to a whole other level in the um, it, during the pandemic. So we're going to talk about that. But what, what I think both Ariella Dubler and David uh, Ingber have to sort of insights they have for us that are illuminating is about how their own experiences with what they're dealing with, as, as I said, on the front lines, how they are, you know, what, what we can learn from them and what, and what lessons they have for the broader Jewish world and help us understand broader trends going on in the Jewish world. So let's jump into it. David, welcome to the conversation. It's great to be with you, Dan. Thank you for inviting um, me. Um, so I want to start with Joel Kotkin just wrote this uh, public intellectual uh, academic wrote this essay for Quillette um, in which he talks about how the pandemic is changing religious life across the board in the West. And he says, we are witnessing, and I quote here, we're witnessing a shift as important as that brought about by Gutenberg's press and Luther's vernacular Bible during the Reformation. Meaning that the, these, we don't fully appreciate, you know, the, the, what, what, what kind of changes we're dealing with. He, he goes back to this, the Reformation's upending of how we thought of religion. He, he says it's comparable. In our post-corona conversations on the podcast, we talk a lot about these trends that were in play. And what the pandemic did is it dramatically accelerated them. So it's not to say, so, so it, you know, again, I'm, I'm going to keep re referring back to sort of economic and market terms because that's more my world. But if you take, we were in a period of like, say, t a 10 year process of digitization. And what COVID did is it packed it all into a year. It took what otherwise would have taken 10 years and banged it into a year. So, like, I'll give you one example that I often refer to is Zoom, right? So, in March and April, really, let's say February, March of 2020. Nobody was talking about life on Zoom. It was like it's, it was seemed to be too expensive. It would seem difficult to use. It didn't seem to many people safe. It wasn't intuitive. And then overnight, 40% of America's workforce suddenly started working from home and everyone got comfortable with Zoom. And in late 2019, there were something like 10 million people 
10 million participants on Zoom on a given day. Okay, that's late 2019. By April of 2020, that number was 300 million. So overnight, and, and by the way, that doesn't count the, in the something like 50 million school, school children using Zoom. So you took a trend that may have taken about a decade and you packed it in to a short period of time. Yeah. So now let's talk about synagogue life. Okay, now <laughs> synagogues have, you know, been in decline for the last couple of decades. All right, I've yeah. got this one stat here that really blew me away. Um, let's see, between 20, here it is. Uh, between 2001 and 2020, the overall number of traditional synagogues declined by a third across yeah. the country with closures of 20% or more in 34 states. So yeah. that was a trend that was already in play for a couple of decades. What I want to try to get into with you is what does it mean for the one year of COVID? What did it do to that trend? Now yeah. you uh, on one level have been very optimistic yeah. by the number of people that are reaching out for spiritual connection and some right. connection to a congregational life, even if it's virtual congregational life. Sure because of the pandemic. Can you, can you speak to that? Yeah, there's a lot there. I, first of all, I, you know, I, I love that you're bringing in business models. You'll speak from your, from your center of gravity and I'll speak from mine. But uh, my father used to always joke around with me and my brother and say, there's no business like shul business, like any business he knew. And so I think that there is a lot of crossover between business and, and synagogue models and sacred center models and community center models. I think there, there is obviously, a, there's a great crossover and, and in particular, I think in, in synagogue life, you know, my experience in the last 14 years as being both, a, I guess, a rabbinic entrepreneur and, and a startup synagogue, you know, we started Romamu in 2006 in the Upper West Side, where there were already at least 50 other synagogues. And yet within five years, we had 600 families in our community. So I think, I, you know, the quote unquote entrepreneurial side of it and also the, you know, all the other elements, because synagogues also are participating in at least a number of frames that I can think of off the top of my head, like the theater industry and, you know, opera, symphonic music, concert, you know, venues, uh, gyms and fitness venues. It's also a therapeutic center. It's has so many different quote unquote industries or, uh, you know, areas of overlap with other places that I think that it's, it's a great place to kind of zero in on and see what's happening. Um, you know, because I think to some degree, it's you know counterintuitive, but over the last year, we have seen in our community, and I know I've spoken with other other rabbis and other community leaders, we've seen an increase in our membership, not a decrease. We actually moved very quickly into a, into a uh, both an in-person membership model, but also a global model, meaning anyone could log in from anywhere with all of its attendant benefits and so on for membership and enrollment. And so we went from beginning the pandemic with um, 700 family units to now we've increased it by almost 100 family units over the last year. Now and that's not geographically geography based, meaning it's it's global. Right. right. So what's what's remarkable, I think, is is that um, you know I think when you look at let's say the industry of fitness, it's very clear that some of the parallels there are striking. Right. A lot of the illiterate or so people who need rabbinic professionalism and some some of the elements within liberal Judaism that might not be in let's say orthodox. In other contexts, necessarily, not, you know, not as an absolute, but necessarily, like there is a sense of needing a trainer, needing a place to go to where people have information that we might not have. And the, you know, the, the need to be in that professional setting um, can be for all kinds of reasons that would, you know, that are irreducible and will always remain. And yet at the same time, you know, with the increase of, let's say, fitness apps and, you know, you know, the the Peloton models and the mirror models and things that happen on a person's phone. I mean, that's also available. I, I, you know, you and I spoke a couple of days ago and I shared with you that this past Shabbat morning, a woman from London, England, uh, logged in from London and shared during our Parsha, our Torah study early in the morning on Saturday morning. And she had found Romo on YouTube and she participated. She actually unmuted herself and shared for the first time in her life, a Torah insight that she said, I, you know, I, I, I had I grew up where my grand grandparents were Jewish, but I wasn't uh, brought up Jewishly, and I was shamed and fear around being Jewish identity. So, the reach of a community like Rome or any other community is that now Judaism has come into the tele evangelical market. Like the need to have and learn the lessons of how you communicate in ancient tradition in modern and relevant ways 
and reach not just the people who have to come because you know you're the one synagogue in their geographical locale but now in some sense they can pick and choose you know the curation nation has come to judaism people can pick and choose you know their morning service from their afternoon service they can go to four different synagogues on one particular you know evening or yom kippur and in fact i know people who did come to romu for kol nidre and then went to uh, you know my dear friend sharon browse in the afternoon you know and then uh, you know these things are are prevalent and so it kind of heightens choice and yet at the same time there's no there's no way to get around it in the post pandemic world people are going to want to be together people are definitely going to want to be together they're going to want to be back in the sacred center and i think if anything you you know you, the the downward trending of synagogue life um as you you know in the pew studies and so on I think it's it's forced in some way Judaism to look at itself and say, if people had to choose and they could choose of anything, how do we make this relevant and compelling enough for people to want to come through the door? And I think that in the post-pandemic world, it's going to be a hybrid without a doubt. Synagogues are going to have to double down on investing in the Zoom community or whatever other platform you use in order to bring people in who would otherwise right not have a synagogue to go to. And in some ways, unfortunately, the market market principles here are also um, are very much alive, that people will choose to move away from a local synagogue that was not adaptive, sufficiently adaptive or sufficiently compelling to find another community um, that might not need their meet their needs for, let's say, during a life cycle moment, but will meet other needs. And maybe people will have like a life cycle option where, you know, you have the local synagogue rabbi or whomever it is to come and help you with, you know, a funeral or a shiva or whatever it is. And at this, and then you have like the weekend synagogue you go to, whose music and whose message really lifts you up. So I think some of those are, are those things are clearly at play, um, and and they've always been at play, right? I mean, Dan, they've always been at play. Covenantal community and consumer community have always been absolutely, uh, you know, interwoven. But it wasn't until the modern period that people actually had more than their shtetl or their village community to go to, and so you know, in some way on the Upper West Side of Manhattan or in LA where you have 50 synagogues to choose from, right? There's a, there's a, you know, that model now has come everywhere. You have a hundred synagogues, a thousand synagogues. And so in some way, synagogues and other sacred centers are gonna have to actually increase their quality quotient. So that, um, you know, so it will no longer be that you belong to the synagogue because your great grandparents, you know, went there, but right, you, that's not assured any longer, that kind of customer loyalty has to be earned with with message and meaning and and with compelling services. I think. You know, you mentioned the the, the mega churches. Uh, there's one study I saw. Rick Warren, you know, Saddleback Church, one of the biggest mega churches. I know you've read a lot of. There's a lot of lessons from him. Generally, he says his online church attendance has more than doubled to 100,000 during the pandemic, while charitable efforts have also increased, which is interesting. And he he had a quote in a piece I read saying, "Our buildings have been closed, but the church is not a building." We're a living, breathing body. The church is a family, not a fortress. We are a people, not a place. We're an army of servants, not an event of attenders. So, I mean, if you read that, Dan, you, it's it's straight out of the second century of the Common Era where the great Jewish adaptive pivot was to rabbinic Judaism, right? When the sacred center of Judaism was lost and, and it was no longer about the place, as it were, you know, you know do-it-yourself synagogues and other like little sacred centers popped up and, uh, you know, there was a great need to pivot in that direction, right? Isn't that what he's saying? It's not yeah, yeah. about like a place, it's about brick and mortar per se, but about, right? Yep. So, but the, but the flip side of that, which you were just talking about a moment ago, is again, putting this in business terms, like when we look now at what's happening, happening to movie theaters, I mean, my kids ask me, will we ever go to a movie theater again? Like ever? Like post Corona, will we ever go to a movie theater again? Truth is, I have no idea if we'll go to a movie theater again, but when you think about the economics of the movie theater business from a consumer standpoint, so if you and Ariel decide, not Ariella, I'm talking about you and your wife, if you and Ariel have date night and you're going out, you and I were talking about this earlier, when you consider to go out to a movie, the two of you, between getting babysitting, getting an Uber, you know, the movie tickets, refreshments, I mean, add all that up, it is close to the, for one movie, one night out, one movie is the equivalent of a year long subscription to a streaming service, HBO Max, Netflix, Paramount, you know, uh, pick, pick your pick your streaming service. And with that, you get about a billion dollars of movie and television inventory, literally about a billion dollars of content. 
and and you can watch it whenever you want. And now you don't get the enjoyment of going out, but the novelty of going out may pale in comparison to the ability to be a watch a lot whenever you want. Turn it on, turn it off, flip around, stuff for you guys, stuff for the kids. Right. So should the Jewish world's version of the local movie theater, right? Should the Jewish world's version, which is the local synagogue, which doesn't have, which isn't necessarily led by David Ingber or an Angela Bookdahl or David Wolpe, you know, these charismatic, um, very dynamic leaders who have big followings, not only in their physical congregation, but in the multimedia world. Should these smaller congregations be worried? Because to your point, you're, you're creating, you're describing a world that's, that's, that's very dynamic where people have a lot of choices. People have that billion dollars of streaming inventory, the equivalent of, does that change the, the local geography of our Jewish lives? I mean, it's a great question. I think if you ask Seth Godin this question, he would have, a, a, I think, a similar answer, which is we're going to see two divergent trends. We're going to see things getting bigger and then the need for boutique also growing at the same time. As things grow and, um, and scale, right, there, there will still be a need, obviously, for someone who does really great rabbinic work in, in a place that has a, maybe a little bit less of that you know, it might not speak to that. There'll still be an audience for that m more niche or smaller community, I think. But in terms of quality, the need for quality will always, um, is a good thing, right? The, the fact that everything is exposed now in some way and, and we can see people voting as it were with their feet. You know, we've always been called the chosen people, but we are the choosing people. And choosing and is really a, a great thing to have the ability to choose where to go. And I, you know, again, it, I, I'm not worried about the app, like maybe the Amazonification of Jewish life to some degree. I'm, I'm not as worried about that also because I think, first of all, there's great, uh, you know, there is great demand, even if it's unspoken, right? I am a firm believer that, that spiritual community, community, you know, in particular, and spiritual meaning, you know, we can leave God out of this for a moment, you know, the, you know, the big God elephant in the room, we can leave that out, but people still need meaning and purpose and a connection with an authentic lineage. And that won't go away. And even if it's unexpressed, the nuns, as it were, the people who don't identify, you know, religiously in the United States are still seeking meaning and purpose and so on in spiritual communities. So that won't go away. The question is, will it be, you know, will it meet that both spoken and unspoken demand with the kind of supply that is compelling and uplifting and, and energizing instead of being enervating? And that's really the question that's at stake here. And I think that overall, right, this, this is, you know, rabbinical schools and training for rabbinic entrepreneurs and people who know how to meet the moment is, it, you know, couldn't be greater at the, than at this moment. I think that meeting that need and, and having rabbinical schools and other training seminars and seminaries connect, right, the next generation leaders with next generation technologies and ways of thinking that are backwardly compatible that aren't, you know, a divergence, but actually a lineage, you know, transmission and connection to what came before. We have always been the pivoting people. We are the people of the door, the people of the pivot, we're the people of the book, all of those things. And so I think that we are, we're set up right now for paradigm shifting, right? We're set up for paradigm shifting. So I don't think that it will be, um, it will go away. People still need to be, you know, shoulder to shoulder with people at some point when that's safe. I think that Shiva Minyanim, Right, Zoom is great, but there's a little, you know, there's a remainder after a Zoom Shiva call. You really want to be there with someone in some very profound way, and that's what community is about. And you know, and you want to be able to say Amen to somebody's mourner's prayer. You want to be able to say I affirm that. And I think all of those things are irreducible, and they will be there, um, f you know, forever. But I think now we're thinking about how wide can we go? How wide can we go? and meet, you know, both the spoken and unspoken need and including, you know, non-Jews are gonna come. We don't have to be gatekeepers in that way. People will come to Jewish community as they, as they do right now. And we welcome them in, we welcome them into the Zoom room. And, you know, I think every synagogue is gonna have a kind of a, an online rabbi at some point, you know, to take care of online community. David Gallup reports that we're experiencing now the highest levels of mental anguish in two decades. In the U.S. and the trends are the trends are comparable in in the U.K. and uh, in the rest of Europe. I should say the U.K. and Europe now they're two distinct places. Um, and historically, religions have expanded during periods of of extreme stress. 
So what are you seeing in that regard? Are more of your congregants and more potential would-be congregants reaching out for help in ways that you just haven't seen before? Absolutely. I mean, we, you know, one of the great things about actually not needing brick and mortar necessarily to accommodate people was that with increased demand for FaceTime or Zoom, FaceTime with people, being with people, we we increased the number of, of offerings every day. We had a communal check-in every day. We did, you know, we reached out to each and every one of our members and people are reaching back out and asking for um, for connection and just to be together. And then of course, more extreme versions of of needing the support of the community. So, I, you know, the essential worker nature of being, I think, a rabbi or being in spiritual community has been borne out in the last year for sure. And I think that, again, I think that there's going to be a greater need for, for this kind of um, spiritual community in the coming years. Uh, I know, for one, one of the things that, that actually has increased over the last year has been the focus on meditation and contemplation given how important it is for mental health and for stability, right? Communities that were had a very strong connection with the meditative and rejuvenative, like the rejuvenative elements of right, meditation and silence have increased exponentially. I know that from both the Romamu Yeshiva, which was a, a kind of a program that we've been running for a couple of years, which focused on meditation. I know that from the Institute for Jewish Spirituality had something like 300, 400 people a day meditating. So the places where spirituality and mental health or religious spirituality and mental health are are overlapping has become a, a great demand, um, and that I think we need to increase the supply for. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it'll go away. I think that it, it's only going to increase. And you have mentioned to me that one thing you've learned. I mean, if 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 being a rabbi at the end of the day, the real connection with congregants comes from touch points, the individual touch point. Right, like like having a conversation or having before the coronavirus an in person meeting with someone, where you deeply connect on an issue they're dealing with or a life cycle event or whatever it may be. That that's gone for now. Hopefully, it'll come back. But one thing you've learned is you can touch a lot more people through this medium. And as your point is, like the end of the of the of the Zoom shiva, <laughs> it's just it's not going to be the same as in person. That's the bad news. The good news is you've learned you can touch a lot more people because you don't have to deal with the inefficiencies of, you know, they or you bouncing around throughout the day to, to meet with them. Yeah, that's again, that that's the, both the, the plus side of this technology and, and this, and this um, paradigm shift. Again, the, the post COVID world will never be able to forget the genie, genie is out of the bottle, right? It's not going to be able to just assume as if this reality doesn't exist and it, and it has its pluses. It's kind of silver, Silver learnings, you know, not you know these silver these things that we've learned is that um, that again with, when people's expectations lowered in terms of the experience, it, we were able to provide something that said you know it's not exactly like that, but it you know it has some things that are beneficial and maybe even better than in person. Shivas, you know, it lacks that warmth, it lacks that connection, as you said, it, it you know someone who could, who would otherwise not have made it to the funeral or not made it to the, the wedding or not made it to um, the shiva can can attend right. Um, jokingly, you know, of course, they can also mute us whenever we're saying something they don't like. That's also a good thing. Or, or they can turn off their camera if they don't want to be seen. We have all those, you know, positives. But joking not aside, I think it's really to have three or four or five thousand people at your high holiday service who would otherwise, let's say, not have a place to go, um, and to have it done in, in kind of the comfort of your home, the intimacy. I think those things were 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 beneficial in in the way of. Kind of not what you would let chachila like from the from the outset say you want, but something that we've definitely gleaned. Um, you know, it has its own attendant. All technology has its attendant shadow and problems that will, will arise as well, and we'll have to deal with those when when we deal with them. But again, I, I think that in terms of institutional life as we move forward, I think that something that has been a long time coming has been, you know, I don't, dare I say it, mergers and kind of and consolidation of resources in a world that has to some degree, limited resources. Um, and I, I think that, you know, th there's a question that I, that I kind of read in the, in the chat here about, about institutional life going forward. I guess we'll take the questions yeah. later, but I, I think that mergers and finding ways to come and do things together, ultimately best practices will win. And I think that the more people realize 
right, co the commonalities amongst the different denominations and the different institutions as to what really touches people's hearts and really means something, really, right, really moves them. It won't create a uniformity, but it will in some way begin, right, there's a, will be a cross, there is a cross-pollination that's happening that will allow for, I think, a consolidation of resources and, and people coming together to do a project without having to divide resources and to siphon off. I think that that'll also be some of the attendant upsides of this. Before I turn Sorry, to Daniela. Dan, just yeah. for one second. Um, can you talk a little closer into the mic? Some people yeah. are um, asking for that. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. All right. Um, before I turn, is this all right? Perfect. Yeah. Before I turn to um, bring in Ariella, David, let me, you know, uh, Alvin Toffler, the late economist slash futurist, uh, coined this term called prosumers, not consumers, prosumers, meaning that consumers had become so expert uh, about narrow niches that they were interested in. And they, they, they really were the ones driving the marketplace in terms of like this, you know, you know, service providers and product advisors were constantly having to be responsive to these highly, highly informed. That was like the new generation of consumer, highly, highly informed niche focused consumers and i felt like we were beginning to see some of that in the jewish world where people had these niche interests right i want a congregation that is the the they would almost view religious life through various ideologies i don't want to just be part of a pluralistic you know congregation i want to be i want to go to the environmentalist focused congregation or i want to go to the social justice yeah. Yeah. congregation or i want the super traditionalist rabbi right. or i want so there was already a little bit back to this point about like a trend that was going on and maybe COVID accelerated it so when you take that trend that was going on already and then you take the technology and the technology experience in religion that was enabled by the pandemic does the trend in that direction get accelerated that's my yeah. first question my second question is does it worry you because yeah. you don't run a rabbi you don't run a congregation with you're not a niche player right well, I, I don't know. I, I think they're definitely in our community and in communities like in New York, it's the Baskin Robbins of Judaism. You can, you know, again, New York was in the geographical sense what we were finding on Zoom. You could belong to six different synagogues in New York and, you know, walk to each one of them in some way. And I remember the bris of my, of my, of one of my children was on the same day as in the bris in another synagogue and half the people went there. It was, you know, so I think that to some degree, I, I know that experience and I think others do too in, in densely Jewish areas that have a lot of options. But I think that the, the tension for, for me personally as a rabbi or in other sacred centers is that we're not in, you know, it's not purely market driven, obviously. We're a sacred center. We, we also have a sense of not just what works, but what should work and how it should work. We have decidedly moral um, vision of what community demands, as it were, not just what the market demands, but, you know, someone like Steve Jobs who said, like, you know, I'm not going to wait for the consumer to tell me what they need. I know what they need. I think the Judaism says that one of the three pillars of Jewish life is kihilah, kiddushah, holy and sacred community. And what that means, being there for one another and being with one another is, you know, something that isn't just important from the sense of like, oh, it'll be great for revenue streams. It'll be great for our, you know, our bottom line or for our overhead or for our, it's important because we think that's part of what it is to be a human being is to be part of a we. It's, that's greater than the I, and that that isn't accurately and absolutely, you know, expressed through the Zoom room, you know. And so, you know, we have to push back on the, you know, I guess the, you know, the extreme curate, curation, the extreme niche blending, which is so wrapped in a kind of, in a consumer driven world, which, which says basically, I'm going to commit, but I'm going to commit with all of these preconditions, or I'll have a lot of different, you know, things going on to meet my needs. There's a point at which, you know, a synagogue or a sacred center will say it's not in the best interest of your soul. It's not in the best interest of your own spiritual evolution and development to, you know, to not be fully present or to constantly be, right, you know, you know, nip, nipping and tucking every single thing about your community. That doesn't actually, uh, you know, that's not a Jewish value. Jewish value is actually to commit and to step in. And so we have to double down on both providing a, a compelling choice and double down also on 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 demanding a compelling or impelling commitment. So those are two you know two pieces of Jewish community that will I think that have to be held in in tension always. And and this is a great opportunity. Again, it's a great opportunity 
to meet and to find as many people as we can, as it were, for whom this message and this technology and this wisdom will make their life better and, and help them flourish. And to do it at a time where that demand is, you know, increasing exponentially. And also to say, hey, um, you know, if you are able, don't just zoom in to this morning's Torah reading, come and show up and and be, you know, shoulder to shoulder with someone when, when, and, and when it's available to us again, which hopefully will be soon. Right. Uh, let's bring in Ariella. And then David will come back to you. We'll, we'll have both of you and we'll hit some of these questions. So is Ariella on? I'm here. Hi, Dan. Hi. So Ariella uh, Dubler is, as many of you know, uh, runs the Heschel School. Before that, she was a professor at Columbia Law School, made quite the dramatic career change. I'm, we, are, we are direct beneficiaries of her career change because uh, Campbell and I send our children to the Heschel School. I'm on the board of the Heschel School, full disclosure there too. And I would say that Ariella has not only been uh, a transformative figure at Heschel, but she really is uh, a visionary and, and a real entrepreneur in the, in the Jewish day school world and in the education world writ large. So um, welcome to this conversation. Um, so Ariella, let me start with this. Uh, I was recently listening to a, a conversation that Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz had, who are two, two venture capitalists from Silicon Valley, and they compared this moment. It's going to sound trivial, but indulge me. They compared this moment to when Google in the late 90s started offering, giving, providing lunch and snacks 24 hours a day to their employees. This was unheard of at the workplace that you go to work and like all your food needs were taken care of. You didn't have to worry about spending money from food, choosing food. It was all there and you, it was there for you whenever you wanted it. And soon every company in Silicon Valley had to follow. And once that happened, there was no turning back that once everyone, every, every engineer in Silicon Valley was getting food whenever they wanted at work, it, it was, that was going to be the norm forever. And they compared the Zoom experience at work during the pandemic to that, which is once everyone got a taste of working via Zoom, it's not to say that they're never going back to in person, but suddenly you have parents who say, you know what, I can have a really incredible professional life and see my kids a lot more because of this kind of technology. And the, the notion of a trade up trade off for a lot of these professionals is never going back. And so as you run an educational institution, what, what do you see as like the part that's never going back, if anything? And what do you see as, yes, the pandemic was a detour, a, detour, a very tough, tough detour, but it was just that, a detour. We are going back. Um, thanks for that. And thank you all for including me in this conversation. The ability to step back and reflect on uh, everything going on is itself a huge luxury for me. So, um, so I'm very grateful to be a part of this. Um, so as Dan knows, I'm a huge fan of the post-corona podcast and I'm basically a post-corona absolutist, um, uh, which is to say, I think it's all going back. I think David and Ariel are going back to the movies and, uh, and I think we're all going back to much more than um, than we kind of imagine we are, but I could be wrong. I also always opposed all, all food in workplaces because I think they were fundamentally unfriendly to people who needed to get home or get some fresh air. So I might not buy- By, whole by, by design, Ariella. It was by yeah, design. <laughs> no, it's, genius. it's genius. And uh, so, so maybe the whole paradigm doesn't work for me. I mean, listen, schools are a funny place to think about all of this um, because while it's true that we- you know, I, we are a part of the adaptive pivot that David was talking about. And, um, and it has been a miraculous roller coaster. Um, I was part of the group of people that had barely heard of Zoom last February. Um, uh, as Dan knows, I almost sent an email out to our community uh, at the end of February that almost raised the possibility that we might have to go remote. And then it was like pulled back because we were never going to do that. Um, and two weeks later, we were remote. So, um, uh, and it allowed our children to learn for months and our teachers to teach for months in ways that none of us had ever imagined. Um, and fundamentally, as I'm sure everyone here has learned one way or another, children need to be in school. Um, and while Zoom has you know, allowed us to do amazing things this year and has allowed us to keep our community safe 
and learning and allowed us to support families in lots of different ways, um, we're, we're going back um, and we're going back in person. Um, but what are we gonna keep with us? I guess right. I think about a few things. Um, so number one um, is less about Zoom than just about, I think, how to think about institutions. Um, we're gonna keep with us that I think that adaptive pivot and the success of the adaptive pivot turns on your commitment to a mission and a set of values. Um, uh, and I think that this year has brought that home for me. Um, I am super lucky to run an institution that is unbelievably mission driven. And there are a number of people on this call who you know, made that possible and I stand on their shoulders. And this year has really reinforced to me that the success of that adaptive pivot is about mission drivenness and transparency about that. And I think we will take that lesson with us going forward. On the more micro level, I mean, yeah, there are interesting things about both learning and community that I think we've learned through the hybrid Zoom experience. Um, you know, like Shiva Minions, we have family members at Heschel events that have never been able to come to a Heschel event because they live in Australia or South Africa or Israel or Europe. And we have expanded our communal reach in dramatic ways that I hope we will hang on to while bringing parents back for parent-teacher conferences, even though that's actually worked great on Zoom also. But there is a certain kind of community- I would argue that it works better on Zoom, actually. Yes, uh, there are that, ways that, that it has worked better, and I'm still going to make you come back for right, in-person parent-teacher conferences, um, even though I hope we will always be able to kind of expand our global educational reach outward. I mean, for what it's worth, we've also learned really interesting things about how kids learn um, that I think we will take forward, not necessarily through the Zoom platform, but, you know, there are types of technology that we've experimented with this year that for certain kinds of learners are just like miraculous and eye-opening. And frankly, our little cohorts for certain kinds of learners are a game changer. We have students who have had their best year in school this year. Um, and that is a wonderful thing to experience and a wonderful thing to process going forward. Were those, were those not to generalize, Ariella, but were those students ones who were facing serious challenges before this year? And then suddenly this, this year was oddly like a lifeboat for them because you of know, the change? It's, it's, both, it's both and. Um, it's, not entirely, um, it's not entirely easy to sort. We're working, you know, kind of what we're all looking forward to this summer is having time, sustained time, to process after a very long nap, um, we're gonna have sustained time to process. And I think those are the questions we're looking at. Like what types of learning disabilities really benefited? What type of social um, sort of challenges really benefited? But let me say in the main, this is challenging for most of our students. Um, and those mental health challenges you were talking about, we're seeing them too. Um, and in the main, we're a part of a national conversation in which my really strong view is kids need to be in school and communities need to do whatever it takes to support kids being in school. Um, just a final thought, um, you know, Jewish day schools opened in September. This kind of links these two things yeah. uh, because I have found it very, very powerful. Um, lots of private schools did not open. Lots of public schools did not open. Jewish day schools opened. Um, and my, you know, my take on that is that our teachers are also deeply committed to a mission that's bigger um, they're committed to teaching Torah, literal and metaphorical, to our community, and they came back. Um, and that's really the game changer. That's sort of the million dollar lesson that we have learned um, about mission. Early on in the pandemic, Ariella, th there was a sense, I think, at Heschel, and not only Heschel, at other Jewish day schools, but that that the online, the virtual communal experiences that you were talking about became for many people much bigger than just their kid's school. Um, it was much bigger than where they dropped their kids off at school every morning pre-pandemic. Um, I mean, the, the feedback we got was incredible about how people were just multiple nights a week, you wound up having programming for adults, for families. T talk a little bit about that and why it was so important and why it worked. I mean, so first of all, again, to agree with David, I mean, I think people have a thirst for community. Um, I think that, you know, in, in regular times, I think um, when we all locked ourselves in our homes, that thirst for community 
um, only only got greater and the outlets for it became much more narrow. So yeah, I think we immediately, I think we did our first sort of mental health parenting program on our second night that we closed um, because we realized we just gathered our rabbinic team and our mental health team and we sent out an email and said, come join us on Zoom and hundreds of people came. Um, and we really recognized um, both that we were serving a need, but also candidly, we were able to do teaching we're not always able to do. Um, I teach a parent class in normal years. I get a wonderful group of about 50 parents. We get hundreds of people on our communal programming. So, right, it's an opportunity to educate about Jewish pluralism. It's an opportunity to educate about um, our mission. It's an opportunity to bring people together. Uh, and there is no question that we have learned a trim. If you had asked me last, you know, last February, once I got over the shock that this was happening, what were we going to be able to do really well on Zoom? And what were we not going to be able to do really well on Zoom? I would have been confident that we were going to figure out this teaching classrooms thing on Zoom. Um, but I would have had no idea how we were going to figure out the sort of communal piece and Heschel is really about community and under normal times, we're just bringing hundreds of people into our buildings every day. And I have a team that really worked together and that's been the miracle. We have really kept the communal piece through getting lots of feedback, lots of surveys and just multiplying lots of possibilities for people to come together when we're all lonely. Um, so we've gotten Without getting into the numbers, I mean the let, let's just say the experience at other schools, non-Jewish schools. I would also argue non-Catholic schools because I think the Catholic school system has benefited from some of these same trends you're talking about. Um, the the experience of families have had has been at best, you know, uneven. What has that um, What has that sort of transmitted to you in terms of what you're seeing now in terms of people who are knocking on the door, saying knocking on the virtual door, saying I want to apply to Heschel for my kid who's in fifth grade or sixth grade or ninth grade or whatever it may be. I never thought I would switch schools. I never thought I'd about a, we'd go to a Jewish day school, but after this year, I want to. So, so let me say first, like, um, you know, we have basically a thousand families. This has been an uneven year. I don't want to oversell the, uh, you know, every day is not, um, uh, you know, unicorns and rainbows around here. Uh, we're running a school in a pandemic. It's hard. Um, uh, children are, um, many children are struggling. Uh, many teachers are struggling. I will say that I am blessed to be at a place where everyone, really everyone has risen to their best selves, which means that in the hard moments, we've been able to talk about why it's hard and try to make it better, knowing full well that like there are a fixed set of constraints on us um, that we never expected to have. You know, I test, I do 1300 Corona tests a week. I spend a lot of time thinking about saliva and positives. And we're just so, so um, I just want to, I don't want to- You've become a pop epidemiologist. <laughs> I have. I don't want to oversell the, um, the evenness of our experience. That said, um, I think people are looking for values and community. I think that was heightened by the sort of um, incredibly um, uh, acrimonious political moment we were in, in addition to the isolation of the pandemic. And we, we have seen many families with the same story, which is sort of, we once thought about Jewish day school in the past, we sort of went a different route, but now we're thinking about it again. Um, and that's been a great, a great teaching opportunity for us. In the end, not everyone chooses to make the switch. Um, you know, as so many of you know, as well as I do, um, that, that kind of market for Jewish day school in the non-Orthodox community is one that like is worth a lot of our attention um, and really thinking about, but many, are making the switch. And I hope that one of the silver linings of this is that we will expand our pluralism and we will be able, um, I should say, hopefully not on the backs of the public schools. It makes me sad every time a family comes to us because their public school has failed them. Um, uh, and I really hope that we collectively get the public schools up and running. Um, but um, it makes me happy every time a family sort of sees the silver lining of this pandemic as a new appreciation of community and the possibility of a communal values-based education for their children. Before I bring David in to, for, for you guys to take joint Q&A, in terms of the, the way technology can enhance a school like Heschel, and not just Heschel, because you know, because the, I think about smaller day schools in parts of the country that don't have access to the resources and the talent that Heschel, that a Heschel does, you do realize that Zoom provides um, you know, sort of augmented resources 
for students who otherwise may not get I mean, my one of my kids is, you know, taking these on the side is in these the Tikva online academy, I, you know, like all that. So, and I, I see the students who are participating from all over the country in parts of the country that would never get access to these kinds of teachers. My son, I remember last year during Yom Azika run, I think it was um, he he was he and a few friends had selected as one of the options through Heschel was you know, the Heschel gave these these electives you could choose for Yom Azik run. And he and his, his buddies were in, a, in conversation with an Israeli soldier at his base in Israel, a, an Israeli soldier who may have even been a Heschel grad, I think. And and so my son at dinner was telling us about, yeah, we had a, we, five of us met with this Israeli soldier today. He was at his base and we had a whole conversation about serving that. And so you just start to think about all these opportunities to, to kind of, yeah, augment the in-person experience with these other resources that are out there how how much of that do you think will continue a and b how excited and creative are your faculty about those kinds of opportunities because it also is a lot of change yeah so i guess i would divide that into two different buckets one is remote teachers teaching our students which we are doing this year um, and we did not do in the past. So we have an amazing group of Israeli teachers, some of whom worked for Heschel and moved back to Israel, some of whom have never worked for Heschel. We needed to sort of um, handle enrichment and support in different ways because children are in one capsule pod all day. Um, and so we have them zooming in from Israel. It has been brilliant, brilliant. Um, my own view is that we are gonna return to classroom teaching where you can build a relationship with a teacher in person, even with the loss of this incredible group of teachers. The other bucket is like speakers from outside. Um, I don't think we're gonna lose that. Um, I think we are going to continue. You know, we had in the lead up to the American election, we had a professor at Stanford Law School who zoomed in twice to like give a lay of the land and take questions from our high school students on the spot. He did it in between two like TV appearances. He had 20 minutes. Um, we just had a parent, two parents who are both in Israeli politics zoom in to talk about the Israeli election. We never could have them gotten them both in person at the same time. Um, we've had activists from around the country zoom in to talk about all of the kind of change and social change happening in different parts of the country around anti-racism, around all kinds of social justice issues. Um, I don't think we're going to let that go. I think that that is a real opportunity at globalization, at diversification of our speakers at pluralism that um, our kids love and our faculty loves and there's huge excitement around it. And you can just get voices in that you couldn't get if they had to fly into New York. Yeah, I've seen that with my kids. They don't they don't talk any, they're as excited about these speakers that they're experiencing through these online I platforms. Think they, I think our students understand this to be a silver lining. Right. right. They get to be in conversation with a group of people that they would not have been in conversation with. And I hope um, and intend for that to continue. Okay, I'm gonna start going into some questions here in the chat and I'll just bounce between Ariella and David. One question, Ariella, um, is you you talked about some students have thrived or at least done better uh, in this setting. The question is about whether or not that tends to be unique to a particular age. Are some students doing better with Zoom in a certain age cohort than others? Um, so, so I actually was speaking less about Zoom. Um, it's, it's very hard to thrive on Zoom if you're a three-year-old. I mean, our, um, our early childhood teachers are superheroes. They taught on Zoom for months. I don't know if any of you have ever watched a group of three-year-olds on Zoom, but like, you know, it's, it's funny unless you have to do it. Um, and then it's not so funny. So I would say what I really meant was almost all of our students are in person. But it's a weird model of in-person. And for some of them, and this spans the ages, this kind of cohorted, intense, um, less socially diverse, more consolidated model with a little more technology has actually been great. And that has been true for our three-year-olds and our 18-year-olds in different instances. Yeah, my, my kids, for what it's worth, I mean, they're middle school, they, they love the bond they have now. They, yeah. they cherish it with this small group that they're in the small cohort with. It's like the teacher described it to us as it's like they're a family. They yeah. operate like a little family. It's quite beautiful. Yeah. And then there are other kids who really need the bigger space and it's really a challenge. Yeah. Um, David, uh, the question here, we got, by the way, we got a ton of questions, which is, which is good. The market is speaking. There's a lot of interest in you too. 
having you two here, you're like the you're like the the, the Megan and Prince Harry of uh, of, of of the Jewish funders network uh, session, which I guess makes me Oprah. But um, all right, so 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 uh, all right, David, are there types of people who are being neglected? or overlooked because they don't feel comfortable connecting online, who don't affirmatively reach out to connect, don't wind up sitting next to a friendly congregant who takes the time to engage them. Do you worry about losing those people? Yeah, of course I do. And I think that, um, you know, technology will, will improve. I think that it, as, as the reality of hybrid going forward is undeniably true, we're gonna, there, you know, it'll force us to, to create some semblance of that. I think we, we tried it at Romamu and other communities around the country, tried to create like a waiting room or a separate room or that kind of thing, you know, with varying results. I think that, you know, there's nothing like a relationship, right? There's nothing like, no program can beat out a person and no, you know, the, the greatest sermon is not nearly as powerful as, as the kindness that one person in the community shows to another. And so communities will have to adapt and, and meet that need too. I mean, it's it's just gonna, you know, there'll have to be special, you know, we have a chesed committee at Roman, a loving kindness committee that actually does trainings on Zoom and knows the particular people in our community who might have a difficult time with that technology. Um, but yeah, I think that I worry about that. I worry about those who are, you know, who are left out of some of the technology or find it really, really difficult. And I can't tell you how many times I'm in a classroom where we have to wait. Um, I'm sure many have had this experience where they have to wait because, Right, the technology is interfering with the experience, and so. But I think that you know this excess right now that we have is kind of an opportunity for excess ability and accessibility. All of those things will work together. We have the ability now to expand, and we also have the responsibility to do it, you know, ethically, morally, and in a Jewish with Jewish values. So we'll find a way too for that. Dave, another question for you: What does the online evangelical? Uh, so I'm reading this question. What does the online evangelical model Rabbi Ingber refers to? Ra uh, does it raise some interesting potential concerns? And the meaning the Jewish communities have what we might consider gatekeepers, while online platforms don't. What does it mean in which people are? This comes back to my point, my Alvin Toffler point about prosumers, right? That they're basically in charge now, and and does that break down? the gatekeeper model in the Jewish world? And does that matter? Listen, I, I'm not sure if the question is about what you were referring to, which is being driven by consumer or prosumer versus um, just the nature of, you know, anyone showing up. Like, how do you, you know, like, again, open door here is exploded door. Like, there's not even just like the people of the no door versus the people of the door being a gatekeeper. I, you know, again, Online, I've seen Dr. Rabbi Dr. Larry, Larry Hoffman having this conversation with others, Ron Wolf, Professor Ron Wolfson, Dr. Ron Wolfson, and others about evangelism and how wide open we go, and whether or not we really believe ultimately that we have a, the Jewish message is something that we don't just keep for ourselves, but actually, it's not you know there's you know anyone can come. Call Dichvin Yetevechol. Anybody that wants to come and eat can come and eat, and you know we have we have we have you know religious Christians on our Shabbat morning services who. Who weigh in, and I'm I'm personally I'm a big believer that anyone who comes to a Jewish service and is you know there to do things Jewishly and to be with you know us doing the things that we do for the last couple of millennia that I have a responsibility to be a great host and I feel honored that they're there participating. So I'm not a huge fan of the gatekeeper model per se, as I feel like you know big talit Judaism is a big thing for me and for many of my colleagues, and I want it to be as as wide as it can be to bring this, you know, I really believe in this, as all of you do too, this wisdom that it, the, the world needs it. So, um, you know, I just, it'll, it'll, it'll force us to have, to ask a different set of questions as it gets this, you know, this wide. That's what I think happens. Um, Ariel, I have a ton of questions here that are all some version of the following, which you basically addressed, but I just want to put an exclamation point after it because a lot of them came through after you made the point. People, people are asking, so is Ariella saying there's no middle ground between going back to normal with some additional online elements and not going back to school at all? There's no middle well, ground. Of course there's middle ground. I all mean, right. I'm in a middle ground. My middle school and high school are only in two and a half days a week. Um, I hope I'll be able to get, I mean, we will get them back somehow next year, five days a week, but I'd like to get them back sooner. Uh, Dr. Fauci gave me a little hope on, uh, on the Sunday. Three feet. On the Sunday talk shows yesterday, from Dr. Cliff to you know, yeah. So we'll we'll see, but um, no, I think there's lots of middle grounds. 
I think schools need to reopen. Um, and there, I saw there were a couple of questions in the chat about risk. Um, you know, we're all in this funny gray area. I do a regular town hall for the whole community. And um, uh, regularly, if there's one thing I've learned, it's like all about communication and transparency. And the one I'm doing tonight is largely about the fact that like we're entering a funny gray period. We've had very clear rules. Everyone's been living by them. And things are, thank God, opening up. And that's harder in certain ways. And we're going to have to learn to take risks. Um, you know, I'll share a little secret. I'm a bit of a germaphobe. I've been in person in a giant school every single day since the day after Labor Day. Um, uh, we've all had to take risks. And I think that actually the Jewish day school community can model that for everybody. No, it's not an either or. We should do whatever we can to get as many children into school as we can. Um, and that doesn't mean don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Like, get them in. The education might not be as perfect as I like it. We might not be able to get everyone in every day, but kids need to be in school in whatever hybrid form we can get them there. I have the huge luxury of resources and a team that let that happen. We need to help others do that also. Let, let me stay on the point about communication because you really are, um, uh, I think it's a real uh, lesson for leaders generally about the point of almost over communicating. You're like, you're like, you know, Ed Koch standing at subway stations, asking people, how am I doing? Um, you talk a little bit about your, your regimen, how often you do the town hall meetings and your every morning being in front of the school, like during COVID, I think it's just spend a minute on yeah. that. I want people to understand just operationally what's involved with that. Yeah. I mean, listen, I recommend everybody like new things are terrifying and excellent in that, you know, I have undefensively said all year, you know what I've never done, run a school during COVID. So like, feel free to give me all the feedback you can, because you know what, you've never done either, run a school during COVID. So we're going to figure it out. Um, so I really believe that one of the keys to success, and I think Jewish institutions should absolutely learn this because it's a, everything's a teachable moment, right? I don't get up without trying to teach some kind of Torah. Um, I often have to talk about the mechanics of COVID testing, but I try to teach some kind of Torah as I do it. Um, I spend two hours outside every morning because that's the only place I can see parents. And we ran a regular thousand person town hall every two weeks um, uh, for the entirety of the school year. We just moved it to every three weeks because I finally had less to say. Um, but I think that people, again, it's community. Um, it's being in a common cause. It's feeling heard. We do a lot of surveys. That's something we're gonna take into next year. We have heard more from our faculty and parents in organized ways that we can quantify and sort of make data-driven decisions than we ever have before. Um, and that's also been a huge upside. David, how do you, I mean, do you find it harder to get feedback from congregants and kind of understand what the, where the mood of the congregation is? now that you're not seeing them in shul every Saturday morning and kibitzing after services. And like the Ariel is equivalent of her yeah. talking to parents every morning. Right. Um, what's, what's your version of that? Oh my goodness. I mean, the chat room has brought the lobby of the shul into the service. You have to, we'd have, we had a major debate about whether to let the chat you know, area be open during services because we were getting live in-person feedback, you know, like, I, you know, good point, Rabbi. I didn't like that point, Rabbi. You know, we had to turn, it's a little bit, uh, you know, disconcerting <laughs> at different points. So you, you had a constant flow of that. And, you know, I think that to some degree, the ubiquity now of, of, of email and, and chat, and we've done surveys too, people are giving feedback. And also we know when we, we're connecting often. Like people, and so we've gone back over and over again, and so have other communities, you know, across the board, what's working, what's not working, what's working, what's not working, and asking people too. And, and I think that it's become quite iterative and kind of very powerful in that way. And I want to just also lift up that the, the beauty of the online space too has also opened this up to, to the diversity. You would have thought the diversity actually would have decreased to some extent, but it's increased, right? We, we find extreme, like the, our community is full of very, a, a really wide array, a very diverse, very, you know, very open community. You know, people on the margins are, 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 are kind of like in the same space now in many, many ways. And I think that I just want to, you know, say that I think that it's, it's, it's leveled the playing field in, in synagogue life. At least my experience has been in that way. It's been a profoundly, um, I think it's been a profoundly important part of the equation in the last 12 months. Um, all right. I, how, I, I want to wrap with two questions. Are we all right on time? Uh, maybe one more question. One more question. Oof, that's 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 tough. 
Um, all right, David, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it with you. Can you just spend a minute, you referenced it earlier, talking about the yeshiva that you're building. So A, can you just put a little more flesh on the bones of what that is? And B, you really were getting it going before, like within about 24 months before COVID. And then obviously COVID changed it a lot. So where does it go from here? I mean, listen, the yeshiva was just basically um, a, a space where we thought a space where people could could study more of what Jewish renewal and the, the community of Jewish renewal Judaism was doing. Uh, Neo-Hasidism, some people call it, but it was a yeshiva devoted to um, a combination of meditation, contemplation, and deep rabbinic study. And it was, you know, we had an amazing court a couple of summers ago, and last summer we had to pivot very quickly to an online community. And of course, one would think that the last thing anybody would want to participate in is a, is a kind of online meditation, you know, experience. And it's actually, we quadrupled the number of people that were in the, in the space, and it continues to see a similar quality. Because ironically, of course, if you're going to try to create a space where you're going to be silent or at least have some kind of contemplative or meditative practice, you're going to actually create a space where that can happen as opposed to a more musical ritual or worship experience. People actually intentionally then create this space where they're silent together um, and the learning was rich. And so we had quadrupled the enrollment and, and we, we expect the same thing. I have a hundred people enrolled in a class right now for that compares Judaism and Buddhism that began last week. And so, you know, and the Slack function, Slack technology allows for so many, you know, cross conversations and postings. It's really, again, as, as Ariel said, it's the silver linings. And, um, and I expect that space particularly to, to, to increase, not just the Roma Yeshiva, but again, Institute for Jewish Spirituality and other like-minded organizations that are doubling down on the place where religion and spirituality meet mental health and human flourishing. I think that that's something that will just increase uh, over over time. And um, yeah. Yeah, can I add one final thought? Because yeah. I see yeah. it in the chat. Um, I just want to acknowledge what people are asking. It took enormous resources to open our school. Enormous. We were able to do it because we have a generous community. We have an endowment. We have funders who wanted to help us um, in addition to the communal buy-in. And if there is sort of one lesson I would like us to think about going forward, every school needs to be able to reopen. Um, and small Jewish day schools across this country that don't have the resources that Heschel has um, or that most of the New York Jewish day schools have in different ways, we all need to be thinking together about how to pool our resources so that um, schools can open everywhere and not be as dependent as we were this year on sort of what you've saved and how well you're funded. Um, Cause it just, um, so many inequities have been exposed this year and that is definitely one of them. So um, I would encourage that Dan. conversation and love to be a part of it. Dan. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I just want to say, I know I also see there's a, there's a, it's lighting up on the chat in this conversation and people really want to talk about it. But I, I hope that I'm I'm on the opposite end uh, as you, Ariella. We, we, you know, Romamu was the beneficiary of two very large gifts from the, from the government without which we would have, you know, we were able to make it through the last 12 months without laying anybody off, which is pretty remarkable. And I can't say the same. Many Jewish institutions did not go that route. So I just want to say that too. It's like, you know, conversations about lowering overhead through using online technology, but also, you know, Jewish communities and synagogues are deeply dependent upon their donor base and on their membership, you know, structure. And so it's obviously, you know, there's a lot more to have a conversation about in terms of who's on the margins and, and inequities and so on. I think and, that, and remember, we're a country that opened bars before we opened schools. So we need to be a community that focuses our efforts on opening schools before we open bars. So <laughs> wait, I, I, go ahead, Ariel, go ahead. That was it. Okay, so I want to just ask you one more question, Ariella, and I know Ari's Ari's going to kill me, but Oprah did also go over her a lot of time with with uh, with Harry and Megan, so I get to with these two. Um, can you talk for a minute? I, I meant to ask you this about the Heschel Fellows Program uh, because that's that also interesting, maybe a silver lining, and maybe a model for other communities. Yeah, so it's a great example because it is a silver lining. I think it is a model and it was a super expensive luxury that we were able to do it. So we basically realized last summer that we had two things coinciding at once. A whole bunch of unemployed young people who needed a job and might be interested in giving back to the Jewish community and a whole bunch of classrooms that suddenly went from a model with 
25 students in a classroom to eight students in a classroom who needed adults, um, uh, you know, you know, full like pulse beating adults to supervise them. And so we created something called the Heschel Fellows Program and we hired a whole bunch of people who were interested in giving back and interested in learning about Jewish education and they have been working in our school. Um, and it's been fabulous. And many, I, we have any number of them who now think they're gonna continue on this. Um, as a career, as something that they have found inspiring and who feel they did give the year back. It was an expensive program. Um, and it is something that we were able to do again because we had the resources to do it and it enabled us to open all of our classrooms on time safely. And it also had the, the derivative benefit, I think, of exposing a whole bunch of young people yeah. to Jewish professional life, Jewish educational life, Jewish day school life when their parents, I mean, it, it there's there, you know, that, that is a benefit that we may not have calculated that I think is real. It's absolutely a benefit. We have thought a lot about whether we could keep the fellows program going, not in its sort of in the number size that we have right now, but we actually very much hope that we are going to keep a Heschel fellows program as really a pipeline into Jewish education um, uh, going forward. All right. We will wrap it there. Ariella and David, thank you. Really, um, you two are are um, living and breathing the the sort of the the, the post corona possibility, not just the not just the peril of the um, of the and the difficulty of the last year. Although you've navigated that too, but there's a lot of uh, uh, uplifting ideas, and this whole conversation was incredibly illuminating. So. Thank you. I'll turn over and, to you. And Dan, before we go, can I just say, I want to thank, I see uh, Marcella lippmann Kanfer rolnick here, and I know that my executive director and Ariella also, all of us know that no community can, can even stand at this moment without thanking all of our lay leaders and all of our, the leadership has been remarkable. The way that people have shown up on so many different levels to, to ensure Jewish life. So you too, Dan, thank you so much for your leadership and to everyone else here. Thank you. Um, so let me just step in here for a second. I wanna thank Dan and our two panelists, Ariella and David. I think this was an amazing session. Um, the fact that halfway through our help team had to scramble to uh, expand the amount of people we were allowing into the room uh, because we had reached the limit. And I think we, we won the day in that sense, uh, really speaks to, uh, you know, is a testament to you guys. So well done.